to, if someone's in this realm of real estate investing, they need to understand that words are important. And a lot of times in our industry, people will use savings, investing, and speculating interchangeably. And they mean something that's drastically different. And so my parting quote for you guys would be to go out there and understand what the difference is between those three words. Savings for us is an action verb, right? It's a, a, you're, you're, it's a, a, a verb that you're doing, an action that you're doing every single month in putting money away. And that's where infinite banking would come in. Investing is where you're doing a level of due diligence prior to ever making some sort of investment. There's a lot of education that goes in before making an investment. And speculating is where you're just throwing money and you're hoping and praying that it works out for you. And if your listeners were out there, I would urge them to do kind of an audit of what they're actually doing with their money and make those three categories, saving, investing, and speculating. The far majority of individuals out there are acting uh, under pure speculation. And we're urging people to revisit that, look at saving, and then also focus on investing uh, and making sure that you understand what you're investing in. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority, and this is the show where we talk about how to raise private money without ever having to ask for money. Well, I was a guest recently on a podcast, and I was just so impressed with the host of this podcast. They talked about infinite wealth and infinite banking. I wanted to invite them to come along. And so that's who I've got here today. It's like, how can you save a lot of money on taxes? How can you combine the infinite wealth uh, strategy along with private money? Well, one of my guests is the founder, or both of them are the founder of this company. But one of my guests, he was working at one of the largest accounting firms. He actually served as the CFO of a chain of restaurants. But after the 2008 debacle and recession, he realized that the solution to financial freedom would never be found in the latest and traditional Wall Street created financial products. Well, his partner and co-founder of the company, he was in business for about eight years as a small business owner, and he came to realize that he was just totally frustrated with investment solutions that were proposed by traditional financial advisors. Well, this led him to discover infinite banking and combining that with real estate investing. In just a moment, you're going to be meeting some of my good friends and special guests, Cameron Christensen and Anthony Faso, right after this. Well, hello there, Cameron, and hello, Anthony. Welcome to the show. We are glad to be on, and we're pumped like that intro yeah. and then that little trailer. That's, that's awesome. That got me going, Jay. We're happy to be here, man. Thanks for having us. Yes. Well, I really enjoyed being on your podcast, which by the way, to my audience, the name of their podcast that you'd really want to check out and follow is called the infinite wealth podcast, infinite wealth podcast. And, um, these two guys have just got, an has got a wealth load of information and wisdom to share with you. And so we're going to be talking about the infinite uh, banking principles or the infinite banking method. We're going to be talking about in this show, how to combine the private money strategy of paying all cash using other people's money to invest in real estate and then how that can be combined into the infinite wealth strategy before we dive in though um anthony you go first and then cameron just tell us a, just a little bit more about your backgrounds since i just sort of touched the hem of it you know the the only thing that i would add on there uh i uh, i did go to i, I did serve in the u.s army uh, and then, then you picked up the rest of my career. But I, I think the most important thing is as a CPA kind of in like the system, I noticed the advice 
to be honest, I was given and people were getting them from financial planners and Wall Street just was not right. That That is not what's going to get, get us there. And then that's when I got exposed to rich dad, poor dad and the infinite banking concept. But the difference is, I mean, I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, years before, but the difference is this time I put it into action. Instead of just reading it from the shelf, I read it and, 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 and put it into action. And then that's when we discovered the infinite banking concept. And then I had my CPA firm and I had, you know, uh, teaching infinite banking. And then I had my family somewhere here on the <laughs> side. So really easy choice. I sold my CPA firm and been focused on infinite banking full time. That is all we do is teach people how to incorporate the infinite banking system to help them create more passive income than their monthly expenses. Nice. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll jump in there, Jay, is that, uh, yeah, I appreciate the intro that you that you gave there. Uh, again, what I would add is uh, probably just the, the way in which I came across infinite banking. It was complete happenstance. I was a small business owner. I was looking for opportunities for myself to put money away. And every opportunity or every option that was presented to me from traditional advisors made zero sense to me whatsoever. And I could not believe, I was late 20s when I was doing this. I could not believe that people were putting money away until they were 59 and a half and not having access to their own funds. That just seemed absolutely ridiculous to me, to be honest. And so I didn't do anything. I sat on cash uh, for many years and uh, it wasn't until I came across infinite banking. But what I wanted to share with the listeners was the way in which I came across it is my wife and I were buying our house and I sat across from our broker and I asked him just from the pure grace of God, if he had a good book for a young couple and he gave me this weird look and he reaches back on his desk and he hands me this book and he goes, if I would have read this when I was your age, it would have been the difference of millions of dollars. And I went home and I read that book the first night. I read it three times. And to be honest with you, Jay, I got really pissed off because in that book on page 44, 45, it lays out some of the things that I was doing incorrectly. And so that's how I got started from that day forward. I've been running down this infinite banking road, trying to learn as much as I can and then sharing it with people. And so I've been in this space for 15 years and uh, 15 years and one day longer than Anthony. So uh, yeah, Anthony, I partnered five years ago on infinite wealth and here we are now. That's wonderful. Now, you guys talk about three reasons that typical financial advice is just flat out wrong, bad advice, leading people down the wrong direction. And tell us what those reasons are. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hit the first one here. Uh, but the first one is that when you talk to people and you sit down with them and you talk about what their goals are, if you keep asking questions, their goals are about right now here in the present. And typically what they're trying to do is they're trying to create as much income as possible. And specifically is they want to go do things that uh, don't require them to go to work. And so they're trying to create as much passive income as they possibly can. And Jay, if you look at all the retirement vehicles that are out there, uh, it is nearly impossible to create passive income from those types of vehicles that are out there right now. And so the problem that most people have is they're delaying, right? This idea of creating income. And so uh, it's a skill that someone has to develop. And what happens is people delay that until they're in their late fifties, early sixties. And it's a skill that nobody knows how to do. And so one of the things that we urge clients to do is to go learn that skill is go learn how to create passive income now today through business and real estate. And so that's one of them. I would tell you a second one is that I say that it, it creates lemmings, meaning like the old uh, story of the of these rodents that will just they will just follow the leader literally off a cliff. And honestly, that's what we feel using using typical financial planning is you're not learning anything. All you're doing is following your financial planner. And oftentimes, as you see, we will get recessions and people will literally fall off. Uh, follow their financial planner off a cliff. And the bottom line is they're not learning anything during the process. Mm -hmm. And well, there was a third reason too, right? Yeah. The third reason that I would say is that people aren't learning anything, right? Is there's no education that comes with kind of traditional planning at this point. So really, if you look at traditional planning now today, 
uh, somebody will go sit down with an advisor and really the message from that advisor is, uh, give me all that, all your money. Uh, you're not smart enough to do this. And so that's been the message that people have been given for so long. And uh, really, if you look at kind of your life, Jay, and you look at some of the places that you've been successful and maybe some of the places that you've uh, failed, I would bet money that the times in which you've failed is when you've outsourced that to someone else. And so, oh, absolutely. That's why I don't want to invest in anything unless I understand it myself. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Right. But that's not the message that traditional advice has given people is people. They tell people, hey, give me the money. You're not smart enough to do this. And I couldn't disagree more. I think everyone's more than capable to control their financial future. Well, we've said it four or five times, so we better define it. So please tell the audience what in the world is infinite banking, i.e. how to become your own banker. Well, I would say in the simplest terms, infinite banking is a, a, a cash, cash management strategy. Infinite banking is not an investment. The investments are what you do with your savings. And really what we're focusing on is really where you store your capital. You have to store your capital somewhere. And I know, Jay, what is so great on what you're teaching people is how to do these investments with really other people's money. So they're not using their own. They're using, uh, they're using other people's money. So what we would focus on is a couple areas. For one, Jay, as I, as I recall, one thing of your strategy is you raise money not just to buy the property, but also for some improvements. That's so right. That, that cash has to sit somewhere. Also, people are receiving money uh, as they're creating income. That has to sit somewhere, right? And uh, that's really what we are focused on. Now, now, Jay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you some questions if you don't mind. Please do. Where Where do you think most of your clients or your students, as they're raising this money, they're sitting it for reserves for either for to invest in, to improve that property or all, um, where are they typically storing that capital? Well, actually, as far as the timeline goes, mm -hmm. when they raise the, the private money, then they have been told or given a, a verbal, a yeah. verbal from the private lender, the individual saying, Hey, I've got 250,000, I've got a hundred thousand, et cetera. And so then we, the borrower, the real estate investor, we're going to say, okay, I'm going to put your money to work for you just as soon as possible. So we don't actually borrow the money. In other words, we don't have control yeah. of the money. We don't borrow the money until we actually have a deal to use that money to purchase that property and then renovate it. Sure. So once you have that property, so they, they pay you the entire 250 in this example. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. Part of it is going to go immediately to purchase it. Part of it is to improve the property. Am I? That's, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. Where are your students typically storing that cash? So the cash, and it's going to be used pretty quickly. It's yeah. going to be used typically within 90 days mm -hmm. um, from the time the, the deal is funded by the private lender. But typically, it's just going to be stored in their operating account, in their business operating account, because it's out of that business operating account that they're going to be paying the general contractor to do the renovation. Mm -hmm. So they're storing it in, in a bank, right? And typically mm -hmm. because it's safe and liquid, mm -hmm. right? So they're not going to lose the money and that they have access to it to send to the contractor. Perfect. Correct. Now, once we withdraw that money from the bank and deploy it in the asset, how much are we earning in, in that account that we took the money from? That was zero. Probably zero, right? Well, with the pro and that, that's one of the biggest problems we have with kind of what people are typically doing. They're using a bank that's safe and liquid, but the downside is once we withdraw the money, we stop earning, we stop earning interest on it. So mm -hmm. we break the compound interest curve. Now, mm -hmm. Jay, at, at what point do you want your money to stop compounding? What would you say? Ne I would say never. Okay, good answer, good answer. Okay, the problem is though, Jay, the system most people are using, we're breaking the compound interest curve every single time. Mm -hmm. All we do with infinite banking, we just add one extra step 
to get you that uninterrupted compound interest. Now, mm -hmm. Jay, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Do you use a rewards credit card? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you just use cash? Well, I like using other people's money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> a good answer. And and on top of that, I like getting uh, I like getting uh, airline miles rewarded back to me. Perfect. Jay. So, Jay, what I'm hearing is, hey, I'm going to buy this thing anyways, whatever it is. I'm going to buy it, but I'm I'm going to add one extra step, a credit card, because th this way I get some extra bonuses, some miles, cash back. If you can understand that, Jay, you can understand the infinite banking concept. Because really, all we're really teaching our clients to do is to add this one extra step to where they store their money and they're investing. So instead of storing the money in a bank account because it's safe and liquid, you can also store it in an account that is safe, uh, probably even safer and just as liquid. And that's an especially designed whole life insurance policy. Now, Jay, if, if you're like me, when I first heard this, as soon as I heard whole life, like alarm bells went off on, on, on uh, in my head and this is a very different concept. The way these policies are designed are very different. I, I like to say that they're not your mama's whole life policy, right? Those policies are designed for death benefit. Our policies are designed for cash value. They're very liquid and they're very cash heavy. And we design it not to maximize the death benefit, but to maximize the cash value. And the reason why this is a better place to store your cash because not only is it safe and liquid, but depending on what state you live in, uh, most states have some level of asset protection. So meaning if you get sued, they are not going to be able to uh, attach to, to your cash. But also th the biggest advantage is we have the ability to either withdraw the money from our policy, just like we would with a bank. But the problem, we, we'd have the same problems we do with the bank, meaning uh, breaking the compound interest curve. But we also have the option to leverage against it, meaning we, um, we, take a, uh, we actually borrow from the insurance company. And they, the insurance company uses your policy as collateral. So really, Jay, we're still using other people's money. And the reason why this works is because your money is still compounding during this entire time. It's still growing just as so we're never breaking the compound interest curve. So what we would encourage our clients to do is to store some of that money. It shouldn't be all of it, but store that money instead of a bank, store it in the policy. And then you're going to, you're going to need to deploy that money. So you just with, you use that money and put it in the asset or in that asset will produce some sort of cash flow or profits from the sale of this asset. You got to put it somewhere. Instead of putting it back in your operating account, you put it back in the policy. So we're not changing your cash flow by any means. All we're doing is instead of using somebody else's bank, we're creating our own banking system by, uh, by using a, a whole life policy. And the benefits from doing that is your money is just safe as liquid, asset protected, and most importantly, the money is going to continue to grow and compound even while we're using it. So we never break the compound interest curve. So um, how accessible is the money? You know, let's say that I've got uh, a deal funded by a private lender um, I get enough for the purchase of the property. Also, I get money up front for the renovation or the rehab of the property. Mm -hmm. So we use the purchase amount, but then we put over in the, um, in the policy, we put the overage for the renovation. So let's mm -hmm. say our general contractor is going to give us three draw requests during that rehab process. And so I get an invoice that comes from the general contractor. How quickly is the, is the money accessible from the policy to pay the general contractor's bill? There's a couple of different ways we can set it up. The way that I've set mine up is I can wire from my policy the same day. Mm -hmm. So I when I'm ready to deploy, I call up and they will send a wire. And if I do it in the morning, 
the contractor will have it by lunchtime. There you go. Well, that's great. Now, in addition to that, um, am I, am I tracking when I ask this question? So I've either got, I've either got the extra cash sitting in my operating account, earning nothing, uh, or I put it over there in the policy. You just answered that question. It's easily and quickly accessible. Is the reason to put it over in the policy and let it sit there until it's needed is because that policy is going to be paying some type of return or rate of return that the bank is not going to be paying. That's correct, Jay. Yep. So that's one of the biggest benefits. Anthony listed off several of them, but uh, the biggest reason that we're doing that is because you can get a greater return on the cash value there. Um, if somebody's out there researching online, oftentimes this is probably one of the the points that people will either overrepresent or underrepresent out there on social media. A good round number that we will share with clients is that when you put money in a policy, you should expect it to grow right around 4% tax-free every single year. Well, the tax-free is, is, uh, is another incentive as well. Uh, if you're, if the, if the, uh, value is, is growing, uh, with no tax effect. I didn't even mention the tax-free and I'm it's, a recovering CPA, but, uh, really, I mean, there's so many benefits of doing this. But the main one, because some of these benefits may change, right? But what, what's not going to change by using this is the ability to continue of your money to compound. Hey, Jay, let's go a little farther back. Let's say when you first started uh, learning this system, imagine if the, that this operating account that you had used, what if that continued to compound? continue to grow during this entire time, mm -hmm. you would end up having more money, which means you can buy more assets. And also what a lot of our clients will do, just like I like to use the analogy of the rewards credit card, we're going to do, we're going to buy these assets anyways, but by using infinite banking and never breaking the compound interest curve, when we are winding down and in retirement, we can draw from that and create tax-free cash flow in retirement. So that's what I like to say is our is your instead of getting miles, you're going to get tax-free cash flow for buying these the asset you were going to buy anyways. So have you all heard, you probably have, but have you heard some of your potential clients say, well, I just hear people talking on the street that this infinite banking thing is a scam. Why, do, why yeah. do some people think that you reckon? Is it just a point of, they don't understand what's going on? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in yeah. there is, is uh, I, I mean, we've, we've both got an answer for it, but uh, I was one of those people. I thought it was a complete scam. Uh, but the difference that I think was uh, found the facts as opposed to people's opinions. So when it comes to whole life insurance, real estate investing, or whatever it is, everybody's got opinions on it, but specifically in infinite banking, uh, there's a lot of opinions that circulate online. Uh, and so it's very difficult to separate fact from opinion when you're doing that. And so as you go down this road is you got really got to get really good at separating that. So what I would urge somebody is that if they're out there and they're interested in it is don't take my word for it. Don't take Anthony's word for it, that it works is go out there and do your own due diligence, go do your own research. Uh, we've got a bunch of resources on our website. Um, we're providing those for you, but if somebody's interested, we've got resources where they can go and uh, figure this out on their own if they'd like to. Yeah. And Jay, like you pointed out, th th this is, uh, people need to learn this concept. This is not for everyone. And we have an online course, Jay, and at the end, we're, we're, we're give you a link where we will offer free access to our course so they can check it out for themselves. And what, what I would add to what Cameron said, because I'm a skeptic as well, for me, it's all about the numbers. And so what really hit home to me, it, it, it wasn't this theory, oh, I get uninterrupted compound interest or asset protection. I need to see the numbers that this will, that my family will be better off by doing infinite banking than doing what I was doing before. And so what we will do with our clients as part of our education process, we're gonna do the math. 
we will actually compare numbers that they're saving and we're doing illustration based on their situation. And we're going to do the math. We're going to store the, keep the money in your operating account, earning nothing and then buying the asset. And then we're going to, well, what if we store that same amount of money, but inside one of an infinite banking design policy and bought that same asset. So cash going in and out on both sides are exactly the same. And then we're going to look at who has more money at the end of the day and more importantly, why? And because of the power of compounding, infinite banking will win in the long run every single time. So, and there, that calculator that I'm talking about is part of, is you will have access to it in the online course. So that, that might be something that we would encourage people to check out for themselves. Well, just to make sure no one misses out, let's go ahead and share with the audience uh, that link and how they can get access to uh, your free course. Yeah, that, that access, uh, the link would be infinitewealthconsultants.com forward slash raising private money forward slash. And what they'll find when they go there, it's a landing page. We'll ask for your email to give you access to get in there, but we won't spam you. Uh, but once you get into the course, uh, like Anthony alluded to, there's nothing salesy in there. It's a whole bunch of case studies. It's all examples of stuff that's actually in place. Um, it's very educational. So uh, if you guys are on the fence, go check it out. Sure. And of course, we're going to have this URL in the show notes as well. Mm -hmm. But just to repeat it, it's www.infinitewealthconsultants.com. That is Anthony and Cameron's uh, business, infinitewealthconsultants.com forward slash raising private money forward slash. Um, a couple more questions before, uh, before we call it a wrap. So many people that are working in corporate America. Mm -hmm. uh, are offered a 401k when they are working there on the job or whatever. And so some of our listeners um, may have a 401k in a uh, pre-existing with a pre-existing employer that's just still sitting there. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have a 401k in the current employer's uh, plan administrator. Um, and so the question is, is there a strategy they could use with those 401ks that could be a better option for them? And a second question along 401ks is someone goes to work for an employer. Should they take advantage of the 401k that's offered? Mm. Mm. Jay, let, let me ask you some questions. Uh, you think taxes are going up or down? Well, I haven't seen them go down. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, me then they're not, uh, do you want to pay them? No, I don't want to pay. Okay. Them. <laughs> All right. I'm just making sure. I'm just making sure. But I want to pay my fair share. So yeah, there's a we, we got, out yeah. there for, for me to ride on. <laughs> so now is a dollar worth more today or will it be worth more tomorrow? It will be worth less tomorrow. Correct. Right. Would you rather pay tax on the seed that you plant in the ground or tax on the harvest that you pull? Out, out of that one seed. I love seeds. I love okay. seeds. Right. The problem is I, I, most people, when, when you phrase it like that, they, they answer just like you did. And the problem is putting money in a 401k or a government created plan violates all three of those. We're putting money in today and, but we put in a dollar today. Hopefully we can eventually pull out five but now we got the tax deduction on one, but now we're paying tax on five at a potentially higher rate. And in between all of that time where we didn't have access to it, we had to go borrow money and use money from other, from other areas. So the point I'm trying to make, people um, need to come to their own conclusion if whether a 401k is something that they want to do in the long run. And I often think when people really look at the big picture, a lot of times they, they, they will stop contributing to their, to their 401k. Now, mm -hmm. I, 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 Jay, I was going to add, so is, uh, here's been my experience over you know the last 15 years or so being in the seat is that a lot of people will come to us and they've been, they have a W2 job. 
They've been contributing to their 401k for the last 10, 15 years. And the reason they've been doing that is because 30 days of them starting whatever industry they're in their career is HR pulls them in and says, hey, we've got a great opportunity for you. And you mm -hmm. can start saving in our 401k plan. And so people start saving, which is great. But the problem with that is that there's no education that comes along with that. And so people come to us, right? And they come to us because they've been doing this for 10, 15 years. And there's this uneasiness that builds because they have no education. They have no idea on how this thing is going to turn out for them. And they have no idea whether or not they're on track. And so that uneasiness just kind of builds and they start looking for alternatives. And so really when they come to us, we're here to provide an alternative to kind of that traditional model of putting money to four, in a 401k and outsourcing that. So what we'll help them do is we'll help them reallocate funds into a policy and then based upon their skill set, we'll help them find some opportunities in business and or real estate where they can start creating some income now today instead of wait until they're 60 years old. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that I would add there is that when you educate someone on this, uh, that these options are available to them, pretty quickly they realize that putting money into a 401k and outsourcing that is not the best thing that they can do. And so typically the first step that they're going to do is they're going to minimize their 401k contributions from the maximum and they'll minimize it down to the match. And so a lot of people are overfunding their 401ks and that's usually the first reaction is they start to take control back of their money, putting it into a policy that we just described so that they can turn around and go do something else with it. And there, th that is how I started my first policy is I took the money out of my, because all of my assets were either in my house or my 401k. So mm -hmm. I liquidated my 401k and I, and, and, and I put that in the policy. Now, again, we're not recommending anybody to do this. We need to go through some, they need to know the pros and cons of what it is that, that they're doing. And that's why we take an educational approach we never tell people what to do. We just tell them what they can do. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't realize the potential that they have. And the bottom line is, what are your goals? Most of our mm -hmm. clients have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and, and he defines financial success as your passive income is more than your monthly expenses. Mm -hmm. And if that's your goal, why are you not putting your money towards your goal? Excellent and question. So they need to take some money, learn learn how to create money themselves, just like what you're doing, Jay. They mm -hmm. should take some time, turn off Netflix for, for a little bit, take your course, learn what it is you're doing, and that can be their, their retirement plan. We don't need a 401k. That's a government plan. We, you need to rely on things for yourself by learning ways to create income and raising private money is a fantastic way uh, to do that. Then you sprinkle on infinite banking. You're going to be able to enjoy the, the life that, that you dreamed of. Wonderful. Anthony and Cameron, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on the show. One more time for all the audience, www.infinitewealthconsultants.com forward slash raising private money forward slash Anthony and Cameron final comments as we bring this show to a close. What I, if you're listening to this, you probably have more questions than you do answers. I would suggest you take us up on our offer. In this course, if you listen to IBC 101, run times 55 minutes, that'll give you a good idea, overview of what infinite banking is. And maybe it's not for you, but at, at, least, you, at least you know. But if it is for you, you're going to have questions and we'd like to be there to be the ones to help you answer it and determine if infinite banking is for you or not. Jay, what I would add in closing is that uh, I've, I've said this uh, a few times, Anthony might get sick of me saying this, but uh, if someone's in this realm of real estate investing, they need to understand that words are important. And a lot of times in our industry, people will use savings, investing, and speculating interchangeably. And they mean something that's drastically different. And so my parting quote for you guys would be to go out there and understand what the difference is between those three words. 
savings for us is an action verb, right? It's a, a you're, you're, it's a, a, a verb that you're doing, an action that you're doing every single month in putting money away. And that's where infinite banking would come in. Investing is where you're doing a level of due diligence prior to ever making some sort of investment. There's a lot of education that goes in before making an investment. And speculating is where you're just throwing money and you're hoping and praying that it works out for you. And if your listeners were out there, I would urge them to do kind of an audit of what they're actually doing with their money and make those three categories, saving, investing, and speculating. The far majority of individuals out there are acting uh, under pure speculation. And we're urging people to revisit that, look at saving, and then also focus on investing uh, and making sure that you understand what you're investing in. Great advice, guys. Anthony, thank you so much. Cameron, thank you so much. And also thank you for the value that you brought for the uh, course that you've made available for free to the audience. And there you have it, my friend, another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm the Private Money Authority. Thank you for joining me. I'm wishing you all the best, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.